Hello everyone, and thank you for joining. My name is Halima Bouzaid. I'm an advisory threat hunter at SEA at RSA, covering the EMEA region. And during this session today, we're going to look at ways to improve the effectiveness of the SOC by operationalizing threat hunting and incident response. So first, if you look at a uh, statistic from 2020, what we can see is that in but just looking at the first half of 2020, we have already crossed the number of cyber attacks uh, compared to the entirety of 2019. And this is even more alarming when we know that the sophistication of the attack is also increasing. And therefore, it's a critical time to be, even, to be even more efficient than before because the number of threats is increasing and the sophistication is increasing. So we, we must be even more efficient than, than, than before. So to be able to achieve that, there are different components that we need to be able to achieve. First, we need uh, the best detection possible to detect the different types of attacks, threats, techniques, and tools that advanced attackers are going to use. We then need to be able to prioritize these detections uh, uh, to be able to look at incidents that matter to the business first. Then we need to respond to, to those incidents uh, based on the priorities and we need to be efficient in the way we can respond to those attacks. And the more the, uh, efficient we are, the more time we will have to do proactive threat hunting, which would allow us to identify advanced threats and advanced attacks uh, that were not detected by the detection mechanisms. And then the outputs of the incident response and the threat hunting will then be used to uh, uh, enhance the detection mechanisms uh, of the SOC to be able to detect those uh, threats more efficiently uh, in the future. So we can see that the more we automate, uh, the more efficient the SOC will be. And to be able to automate more, we will need to have better intelligence to know exactly what type of threats you are expecting, what types of attacks you are expecting to be able to automate uh, the, the, the detection mechanisms for those types of threats. So if you look at the first row that we would require in, in, in a SOC, it is the cyber threat intelligence uh, team. So the names of the teams can vary from organization to the other, uh, but the role will be a bit similar. And these are roles, not specific people. So, so it's important to say that uh, often what we, what we do is that a, a single person would have a combination of multiple roles uh, and doesn't necessarily have to be one person for one single role uh, and so on, because we need, we understand that the number of resources available in the SOC are sometimes uh, uh, limited and we need to operate in an, in an efficient way uh, within the SOC. So the cyber threat intelligence team uh, has the role to, to look for the types of attacks, threats, and intelligence that matter for the business. And this is uh, very specific to the organization, to the country, to the geographies, and to the types of attacks we would expect. And the role will be to look at uh, uh, this different intelligence, prioritize it, uh, 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 create different categories, uh, to be able to see what we need to detect, what we need to look for uh, uh, in, in the SOC. So if you look at uh, some examples of different types of attacks, typically we can categorize them into two uh, main groups. Uh, opportunistic attacks are typically uh, uh, community malware. This is where we, we don't really focus a lot on in terms of advanced detection because this is based on community malware, known types of attacks, known types of, of threats. Uh, the attacker is not really targeting a specific organization or person. And therefore, he just wants to uh, uh, breach as many people as possible independently from uh, the organization. Now, there are some exceptions. We can see today that ransomwares are, bec are becoming a bit more sophisticated. But as an overall idea, uh, typically these types of threats are more easy to identify and detect through different IOCs, file hashes, and so on. And therefore, existing security mechanisms uh, are more or less sufficient for these types of attacks. But the main focus is really on the targeted types of attacks where the attacker uh, is often uh, uh, very well funded, often state sponsored, state -sponsored uh, very methodological. They have access to lots of resources. And that's where we will see that the attacker is going to build a custom malware for a specific organization or he will leverage uh, uh, zero day exploits and so on. And therefore it is much more difficult to detect these types of, of attacks because they don't rely on, on previously known uh, uh, malware or tools or, or uh, 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 viruses. And that's where we have to focus mainly and mostly on, on techniques uh, used by the attacker to be able to detect these types of attacks. So what we, when we look at the region and uh, APT groups, this is just as an example, just a subset of some of the active, uh, active APT groups in the region and in Saudi Arabia specifically. And specific groups target specific types of industries and organization. So we can see that it becomes very important to understand uh, uh, which attacker we expect to attack us. 
because once we understand this idea, we can start to understand and, and start to try to look for ways to detect uh, uh, behaviors and techniques used by the specific attacker. So then it, it we come back to this to this uh, idea that we need to know the attacker pretty well. Uh, because what we know is that even though the malware and the tools might uh, change from attacker to attacker, or the attacker might change uh, uh, the, the exploit he will use, he might recompile a specific binary, and the hashes therefore will be unique to the organization. But what we know is that most at, uh, uh, APT groups are going to use similar techniques over and over again, even though they might rely on different exploit and different malware and different uh, 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 file hashes. So if you look at an example, for example, if you look at APT34, we know that they use brute forcing techniques. We know that they use PowerShell. We know that they use Mimikatz to dump uh, passwords from the machines. We know they use web shells. So if we know that, uh, if we expect a spe specific APT group to attack us, then we know which types of techniques and which types of attacks we need to identify and to be able to prioritize within the SOC. So sometimes it's a bit complicated to, to uh, do this investigations and do this uh, uh, research, but this information, there's a lot of information available publicly on the internet. The Metra uh, website has lots of this information. And even if we look at uh, RSA Intelligence Orchestrator, which has a threat intelligence platform uh, built in, I just did a quick search on Saudi Arabia in the TIP platform, just to look at what information we have related to Saudi Arabia. If we look at the first screenshot, uh, over here, we can see that uh, uh, different types of uh, APT groups or techniques or uh, 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 different campaigns being launched in Saudi Arabia. So this can bring us lots of information that what to expect uh, uh, from attackers in, in a specific country or a specific region. Then if we drill down into a specific APT group, in this case, APT39, we can then see more information about a specific APT group. So we can see which type of techniques they use. Uh, these are mapped to the Mitra attack framework. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, based on those techniques, based on the tools they use, based on the different industries that we know they target, we can start to identify and prioritize what are the techniques that we need to identify. So if you drill down into a specific technique, uh, uh, we can look at, for, for example, specifically remote file copy. We can see what other groups use this specific technique. And uh, as well, we can look at ways to detect the specific uh, uh, te technique. So this information becomes very important because this is what we will use uh, uh, to identify the threats and the, the techniques that are important and that matter for the organization and for our business. So then the, 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 the team would be would typically create a, a heat map based on what applications we have, what types of, of segments we have, what type of, of tools we have, and uh, what are the techniques that we need to identify on each and every single one of those different tools and assets that we have in, in the organization. Then based on the, the, the techniques that we need to identify, we would map it then to the type of data that we need to be able to detect the specific uh, techniques. So do we need logs only? Do we need packets? Do we need endpoint data? And what we can quickly see is that a single type of data is, is never sufficient to really cover all the techniques that we need to identify. So we need, the, we, need, we need a combination of logs, packets, and endpoint as a minimum, as well as threat intelligence and business context. So just to tackle a bit quickly the, the need for, for visibility, if we look at a typical organization from a very high level perspective, uh, typically we see that we have the on-prem data center. Uh, we rely more and more on cloud applications, so it could be cloud providers or cloud applications. Uh, and uh, specifically in, in, in these times, we see more and more uh, reliance on a remote workforce and, and remote users. The remote users might be connected on the VPN, uh, in the first case, or they might be connected, uh, they might be disconnected at some times to the, from the VPN and have internet access on their own that bypasses the security controls of the organization. So from a visibility perspective, what we need typically is, is first we need obviously logs. So we need to collect logs from the internal network, but we also need to collect logs from any cloud application that we might be using in the, in the organization. Uh, then having logs alone, as we mentioned, is not sufficient. We will need to add as well endpoint visibility. And that's where, that that's where we would deploy our endpoint agents to have endpoint visibility uh, uh, on, on, on all the different assets that we own, whether it is on-prem, whether it is in the cloud, or whether it is remote users. And it's very important that the remote users to have visibility, whether they are on the VPN, or if, even if they are not on the VPN as well, we still need to have visibility over what's happening on their, on their endpoints, on their machines, because often we see that the attack and the initial breach can happen at that point in time when they are on a public network or on, or on an insecure network, 
where there are fewer controls than other organization. And then finally, we also need to have network visibility and we also need to do a full packet capture, whether it is in the cloud, whether it is on-prem. When it is on-prem, we look at in, uh, uh, north-south traffic uh, mainly because this is where we know that the attacker will come in or take data out. But we also need to look at east-west traffic to look at lateral movement and where the traffic is going from, from which subnet to which subnet, what data is trying to collect and so, and so on. So this is just to show a, a, a typical scenario I would look at logs, network and endpoint visibility across the organization, whether it is on-prem, in the cloud or for the remote workforce. So th this leads us to the second role in the SOC, which is the content analytics teams. And basically what this team will do is that they will take the output from the, from the threat intelligence that, that was gathered, uh, uh, the different types of, of techniques that we need to identify, the, all the intelligence that was, that, that was gathered. And then the role is to create the content to detect those types of techniques and prioritize them as uh, uh, requested by the, by the threat intelligence team. So this would require creation maybe of, of, of correlation rules, maybe deployment of, uh, uh, of new devices, new, new, new solutions. Uh, but basically this is a team will, that will create the, the automated detection for the threats and the techniques that we need to identi identify. And as done previously, so they would typically take the, 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 the coverage map that was created by the intelligence team and they would add the coverage that we have. So it's not only enough to, to know which type of data that is required to detect the threats, but we need to know if we have this data available in, in the organization. Because then we can, we can understand if we need, for example, the specific logs that we need, but maybe we are not collecting these logs, then there might be some configuration requirements to collect those, those missing logs. We might have a specific solution which is not in place and we might need to justify the acquisition of an additional solution to gain the visibility which is required to identify a critical uh, techniques uh, that we expect to, to target our, our organization. So based on that, we would then create the different uh, 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 rules to automatically detect those types of threats and, and attacks. So if uh, uh, the, based on, on, on this information, the, the team would then create, as we mentioned, the detection capabilities. So if it is, it is based on a known signature, if it's a known file, uh, file hash or an IP address or a domain, it would be a, a simple signature that has to be created whether on the SIM solution or on different solutions. Uh, it can be based on, again on IP addresses, domain names, file hashes, and so on. If it is a, 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 a technique or a procedure used by the attacker. Uh, for example, if it's the attacker is known to be using uh, brute forcing uh, attacks or uh, uh, other types of techniques, then we might need to create specific uh, correlation rules. Uh, so this might be to look at specific patterns or specific succession of events in a specific order. These can combine uh, uh, events coming from different uh, uh, sources, whether it is coming from logs, packets, and endpoint, to be able to attack, uh, to detect efficiently these uh, types of techniques uh, uh, used by the attackers. Then we want to look as well at uh, uh, behavioral models. So for example, we want to understand what's the normal behavior in my organizations and then look at deviation from the norm for specific users. So for example, if a specific user uh, uh, typically doesn't uh, 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 copy lots of files and suddenly he's copying a big number of files, this is a deviation from the norm. If a user typically doesn't communicate with a specific number of servers and suddenly he is, that's another deviations. So that's where we will rely more on machine learning and UEBA to detect those types of deviation from the norm in the, in the, in the organization. And finally, for anything else, so anything that uh, uh, cannot be detected through signatures, that cannot be detected through correlation rules, and cannot be detected through machine learning and UEBA, typically this is where we would rely on threat hunting, where the, the threat hunting team would proactively look for deviation from the norm, would look for anomalies within the, the, the data set that we have, and to identify potential threats in, in the environment. And we will tackle this in, in a bit more details at, at a later stage. So basically the first part of the, uh, uh, of the pyramid uh, uh, is uh, where we can automatically detect uh, specific threats with the signatures, the TTPs and the, the machine learning. And the second part, the threat hunting part is where we do proactive threat hunting. And again, each one has its advantages. So the, the proactive threat hunting has the advantage of being able to identify threats as early as possible before specific signatures or behaviors uh, have manifested in the environment. So this allows us to detect the breach earlier than, than, uh, 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 than possible with, with, with just through, through correlation rules uh, and signature-based uh, detection tools. 
So then this leads us to the third team, to the, uh, to the critical incident response team. This is typically the L1 and L2 analysts, and their role will be to uh, investigate the incidents and the alerts that have been identified by the uh, uh, mechanisms co uh, configured by the, by the CAT team. And basically what they will do is they will first investigate uh, uh, incidents based on the priorities of those incidents, based on what's important and critical to the organization. And through the investigations, we will try to close as many incidents and, and uh, uh, alerts within the L1, L2 analyst uh, teams. If, uh, if for any reason, uh, a specific amount of time passes and they're not able to close an incident, it would, be, it would have to be escalated to the L3 analysts. Uh, but for most of the cases, we, we see that more than 70 or 80% of the cases have to be closed within the L2, L1 and L2 analysts. Based on those incident response uh, uh, procedures and, and, and uh, the outcomes of the incident response, uh, uh, we would identify some uh, often more IOCs and more indicators that would be fed back to the threat intelligence team to then be fed back into the correlation rules to be able to detect the threats more efficiently in the future. So again, the, uh, as mentioned, the L1 and L2 uh, uh, would, would start from the prioritized incidents, which are the incidents which are critical to the business, which are typically uh, uh, the ones uh, uh, done by APT groups or advanced attackers, uh, which have higher priority than uh, commodity malware because the impact of those types of attack is, is, is much bigger. And one of the difficulties we, th we see in the L1 and L2 analyst teams is that a lot of, the, of their time is wasted and, and, and spent on collecting the data required to do the investigations. So it is very important and critical, really critical, to have the data that we need to do the investigations uh, uh, beforehand. So having the data beforehand available will save huge amounts of time in terms of investigations. Because again, we, we see in, in, in the field that a lot of time, a lot of the, the time is wasted on just collecting the data required to do the investigations, because a lot of time we need to collect specific artifacts, specific uh, uh, PCAPs, specific logs, and this data is not always accessible. Sometimes it is too late to collect it, and it makes investigations uh, uh, much more difficult and much slower. So again, the, the, to do the investigation, we would need typically logs data, network data, endpoint data, threat intelligence, and business context. And just to illustrate this with, with, with an example, if you look at a typical uh, uh, log message or NetFlow message, uh, it would have very limited information. It would have maybe the, the source IP, uh, destination IP, port number. If it's a firewall uh, uh, log, it might have some information whether the rule was blocked or permitted and so on. But really the information provided is very limited and doesn't really allow us to identify if this is something uh, normal or abnormal uh, uh, or expected uh, in the environment. So we need to add more details to, to, to that data. So by adding threat intelligence in the business context, now we can see, for example, that the source IP is an IP coming from China. So do we expect uh, 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 IPs from China to communicate with a specific server? Yes or no? This would allow us to identify, uh, uh, to have more idea, and more context around uh, what's happening. Then in the destination IP, even though it's a private local IP, by having the business context, we know that this is uh, uh, an, an internal web server. So this can allow us, this again gives us more context around what's happening. In the second scenario, we can see that there's a local IP communicating to the uh, in outbound direction with a tour entry or exit node. So this gives again more context to, to, this, to the sessions. Then if you add packet data, then we can see the content of the payload for each session. So in the first case, we know that there's an IP in China communicating with my web server over a TCP 80, so it is, web, it is uh, web, which is expected for web server. But within the payload, we can see, we can start seeing some anomalies. So we can start seeing that, uh, for example, there's an HTTP post without a get, which is not typical of a human behavior. Because on the, on the web, typically, if I want to submit a form, uh, I first need to get the form. So if I want to post the data, I, I, I must first get the form to fill the form and then post it. So just posting data without pro, prior to that getting the form is not normal human behavior. Now, it, it does happen very frequently, but mainly within uh, APIs, mobile applications, and so on. But for a, for a human to use a browser and posting post data without uh, getting the form, it is very abnormal. Then as well, we can look at the, 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 the way the, the data that is being, being sent is encoded. So for example, if it is B64 encoded, it might be that the attacker is trying to hide uh, what information he is sending. In the second case, we can see that the traffic is uh, uh, from, an, from an internal IP again to, uh, to a, a Tor IP. 
It's supposed to be UDP 53, so it's supposed to be DNS, but we can see that the payload of the DNS traffic is actually the payload of FTP. Uh, so is, this is a typical uh, 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 tunneling traffic where uh, the attacker is is using FTP over uh, UDP 53, maybe to bypass a firewall or to to to, to try to to look uh, uh, non suspicious. And in addition to that, by having the payload, we can even see every single FTP command being execute, executed, as well as every single file being transferred over FTP. So in this case, even we can analyze what types of files are being transferred. So we can we can understand that the file being transferred is a password protected zip file, for example, in this case. So which, which brings uh, more suspicion to, to uh, this type of, of, of traffic and session. Then if you add uh, endpoint data, we, we can know exactly, you can start seeing the exact uh, behaviors happening on the endpoint itself. So in the first case, we can see that on my web server, we can see that the Apache service is running uh, PowerShell, which is typical of a web shell attack. So at this point, by having all this information from the, from the log, from the threat intel, from the network and the endpoint, we're 100% sure that there is something malicious happening and the, the, the system is, is, is compromised. In the second case, we know that the potential attacker is exfiltrating data uh, uh, to, to an outbound location, but having uh, visibility over exactly every single command executed on the endpoint itself, we can see the command that the attacker has executed, and therefore we can see uh, 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 the command that he used to compress the, the, the files. So we can see which files have been compressed, as well as which password he has used in the command line arguments uh, to create the password protected zip file. So this becomes very important because if I can extract the zip file from the network sessions, even though it is password protected, I can now decrypt it by having the password on the endpoint side, open it, uh, open it, extract the files and understand exactly which files have been stolen and understand the exact impact that this has on my organization based on what data has been lost. And of course, having all this in, in a single platform makes it much faster and much easier for the analyst because they will have all the data and all, uh, all this information in a single platform, single interface, and he's able to navigate it uh, much easily and much more efficiently and much faster. So again, uh, as we mentioned, so uh, uh, as we do the investigations, we will identify more artifacts and more IOCs. For example, we might have identified new IP addresses, new domain names, specific, for example, if there was, uh, uh, there was an FTP connection, we can see the username and password used by the attacker for his, for, for his FTP server. So we can start using these different uh, uh, artifacts to enhance our detection uh, rules and detection mechanisms to automate the detection in the future uh, more efficiently and reduce false positives uh, uh, in the future. And again, as well, for any uh, any be any uh, a task that the analyst is doing uh, uh, over and over again, uh, uh, it is very uh, uh, encouraged to automate it in the future. So that's where automation and orchestration becomes uh, important, uh, where we want to do to create playbooks. Uh, uh, to automatically do specific tasks uh, that the analyst used to do manually and that might uh, consume time uh, in, in, in many cases. So a lot of time analysts uh, have preferences to look for threat intelligence in, in specific uh, cloud services. Uh, uh, so doing it manually can be con uh, time consuming. Uh, uh, so by having specific playbooks, we can automate this whenever incident is generated. Uh, the, the playbooks can go extract a, a specific, uh, the email, uh, phishing email from the network solution. Uh, extract specific URLs from that email, then validate the, these emails with uh, a different reputation databases and bring in all this information into one location for the analyst to look at it. So this will save a lot of time for the analyst uh, when he does his, his investigations. So the automation is not just limited to the enrichment of the data. Uh, it's not only limited to bringing in data from different sources into one location, but also it can help automate specific actions if, if required. So if you want to automate specific actions in terms of remediation uh, uh, on the environment, this is something that, that automation can also uh, be used for to make the SOC even more efficient. And finally, the last role that we want to talk about is the advanced tools and tactics team. team. So typically this is the L3 analysts. Uh, and, and typically they will investigate all the incidents that have been escalated by the L1 and L2 analysts. Uh, and, and what we want to do is that uh, we want to try to reduce as much as we can the load that we send to the L3 analysts because we want them to use most of their free time or other course free time because it's not really free to do uh, uh, threat hunting uh, uh, in the environment. 
because the more free time they have, the more threat hunting they will be they will do, the more we'll be able to identify uh, threats that have that went undetected. And these are the threats and the breaches that are the most critical because they, they are the ones that will have the biggest impact on the environment because the attacker is in the network, unseen, undetected, doing whatever he wants, exfiltrating data and, and or, or making different types of damages. So the more times they have, the more likely we are to detect these breaches as early as possible. And most importantly is extract uh, uh, the tools, the techniques that the attackers have used in those cases and the different indicators to bring them back to the threat intelligence team to be able to detect proactively these types of threats in the future uh, when they occur again, if they occur again. So as an example, this is just an example of, of things uh, 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 threat hunters might look for when investigating or doing threat hunting on network data. So they would typically look for anomalies independently from uh, uh, the protocol or the sessions or the directions. So based on the protocol, they will look at specific anomalies specific to that specific protocol and then try to identify potential breaches uh, 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 in, in the environment uh, uh, to detect them as early as possible. So as, man, as mentioned, uh, 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 at the end of the threat hunt, uh, typically whenever something is detected, uh, we want to enhance the automated detection rules by using the, outp the outputs of the, of the threat hunting uh, th sessions done by the threat hunters and the threat analysts. So again, this is just a way to again, enhance and make the SOC more efficient to detect more threats and, and, and more, more importantly, th really the threats that are the most sophisticated and the more dangerous for the, for the, organ for the organization and the environment. So now we'll jump to a, a, a demo. So in the demo, uh, we will launch uh, in real time uh, uh, an attack, which is typical to, to APTs. So I have an example of, AP, of, of APT39. These are different types of uh, techniques that they are known to be using uh, uh, in the wild. Uh, um, and we'll look at, I picked a couple of, of the techniques uh, uh, that they use uh, just to create uh, a simulated APT attack. And we will look at how easily they are performed by the attackers, uh, how easily they can breach systems and uh, escalate privileges, dump uh, passwords and so on. And then we look at uh, uh, by leveraging the mechanisms and the, the, the techniques that we, that we mentioned in terms of threat intelligence, building correlation rules, prioritizing the incidents, how we can identify those techniques that are that we see as critical more efficiently. So I have tagged them with the, with the, uh, with the IDs from the Metro Attack Framework. Uh, and these are the techniques typically that if I want, if I know that I am targeted by APD39, these are some of the techniques that I, I have to detect and I have to identify in my environment. And we'll see how these are identified within uh, uh, our solution within our say not witness. So I'll jump now to the demo environment. I'll just open uh, uh, the environment. So on the left side, I have the attacker VM, which is a Kali Linux uh, box. It is running uh, a Metasploit, which is a pen, pen testing framework uh, from where we can launch multiple types of attacks and exploits. And on the right side, I have the, the victim machine, uh, uh, which we will compromise through a phishing email. So the first technique we want to identify is the, the, the uh, breaching, the, doing the initial breach through, through a phishing email. So this is an email that, that I will send first just to be able to, to capture it on the network side. And uh, from there, the, the user typically would open his email account, uh, will wait to receive uh, the email that, that was just sent. So I'll just click on send receive. So we receive the email, the, 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 the email might be targeted, it might be customized for a specific user. So depending on the role of the user or his role in the organization or his interests and so on, the attacker might customize an email uh, uh, to try to trick the user, to increase the chances of the user being tricked by the email and opening the attachment. So in this case, the attacker claims to be, to be sending uh, uh, an invoice. Uh, the victim might double click on the attachment uh, then the attachment is an Excel sheet. Uh, the Excel sheet uh, uh, mentions that the victim needs to input some uh, uh, his password or whatever in the in the file to be able to unlock the uh, uh, the invoice because the, the content of the invoice might be uh, uh, sensitive. But basically, what the attacker is trying to do is just trick the the, the user into enabling uh, uh, macros. So let's say that the user was tricked into doing it. He puts any kind of numbers enable content. And at that point of time, it unlocks the content of the invoice, which is actually a fake invoice. 
Uh, but what we can see on the attacker side is that by doing that, uh, at the back end, there was a macro that got executed. The macro launched a, a PowerShell, PowerShell connected to the uh, attacker's uh, VM. And we can see now that we have a session that has been connected to the, uh, uh, to the attacker uh, environment. So if I look at my sessions, I can see that there is one session connected. Uh, it is coming from a 64-bit machine. Uh, this is the hosting of the machine and the user. This is the IP of the attacker and the IP of the victim. So from there, I can connect to that specific uh, session. I can uh, try to look at which credential, uh, credentials I have. I am under the uh, uh, RSA user. I could try to escalate my, my privileges to system by doing get system. Uh, typically, this will fail because uh, UAC is enabled, so I will have to use an exploit to bypass UAC, but I'll do it uh, in the next step. I just get shell access, just to show you some examples. So right now, I have shell access to the uh, victim's machine, and technically, I have access to his machine. So for example, if I just check the host name, this is the host, uh, the host name of the, of the, uh, of the user. Uh, I can execute specific uh, tools. So if I open Notepad, we can see on the right side that Notepad was executed uh, and so on. Uh, so next, what we could do is, so if you can look at the, at the uh, techniques we have seen so far, so we have the phishing email done, Office application executed PowerShell, it, it got connected. So next we want to look at uh, possibly the attacker wants to uh, do some, uh, 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 he wants to explore uh, what other machines are available on the network, uh, any SMB shares, any uh, other systems in the environment. So what can be done is simply use existing uh, commands. Uh, so for example, u and the t stat minus a, I'll scan specific IPs uh, uh, from the environment. So for example, I can check if specific machine is available. So we can start looking for, for, for different machines uh, uh, on the network. So the attacker is, has full access technically to the environment to do to launch this, these types of commands. Um, then if we look at uh, uh, other things he wants to do, he might want to uh, uh, create persistence. So basically right now the, the uh, uh, that the victim is connected to the attacker, but if he restarts his machine, the attacker will lose access. So what attackers need to do is create persistence uh, so that to make sure that if the, the, if the user closes specific processes or restarts his machine uh, or, or logs off and, and he logs on, for him to reconnect to the attacker's environment. And this can be done in different ways. It can be done by uh, uh, creating uh, scheduled tasks uh, so that a specific command is executed at, at, at startup or by uh, modifying the registry key and so on. So we'll do it through scheduled tasks. To do that, we will need uh, 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 to escalate our privileges. So first, uh, what I will do is that I will, uh, uh, we will download uh, uh, um, uh, Mimikatz because we will need it at a later stage to do the password dumping. Uh, so what we'll do is simply run a command, which is using bits admin to download uh, the Mimikatz executable to this slash uh, uh, user slash public uh, folder in the on the victim's machine, so I will run this command. This will this will download the Mimikatz executable to the uh, victim's machine, and once I escalate my privileges, I will then be able to uh, uh, use this tool to dump the passwords from in clear text from the access process in memory. So this has been downloaded. I can uh, verify it by going to CD users, CD public list the directory and I can see that the file has been downloaded in the, in the location. So then I'll, I'll exit the shell. And now what we want to do is that we want to use an exploit to be able to escalate our privileges. So I will go uh, back and I will use an exploit to disable uh, uh, UAC. Windows, local. Um, so this is the uh, uh, the exploit that we will use to disable UAC, UAC that will allow us to escalate our privileges to system. So by checking show options, this will tell me the parameters that I need to provide to successfully uh, launch the exploit. So first I need to specify uh, what is the target system. It's a 64-bit system or x86. In my case, it's, an X, it's a 64-bit system. So I need to change this to 64-bit. Uh, we need to, and I need to, to set a payload. So once the ex exploit is executed successfully, I need the victim machine to connect back to the attacker. So I will set a reverse uh, TCP connection. Uh, reverse, to printer, reverse TCP. Uh, 
sorry, set payload, windows. Interpreter. Now, if I, check, if I check the options, I still need to identify, so it will connect, so the, the payload will connect back to the IP of the, of the attacker. And I need to specify in which session I want this exploit to be executed. So the sessions that we have are, uh, they have IDs, and this is the ID that I want to use. So set session one, and now I can launch the exploit. So by launching the exploit, we will see that uh, uh, something got executed. I can see that a new session has been provided uh, uh, in my environment. So now if I check uh, sessions, okay, it's already connected to the session. If I check uh, get user ID, I am still RS, the RSA user. But now if I click, if I launch the get system command, get user ID, now I am, I have system privileges. So now if I connect to the uh, uh, victim's shell, I now have full system privileges. If I check my, uh, uh, again, if I check my uh, user from here, I can check that I have the system privileges. So from there now, as you mentioned, we want to create a, a, a scheduled task. So I would just uh, uh, put the command. So in this case, I'm creating a scheduled task to be executed at logon. In this case, it's just executing notepad, but it could have been any malicious commands to, comment, to connect back to the attacker's uh, machine. So I launched this command, this creates a scheduled task, schedule task successfully. So now the next step is I want to dump password using Mimikatz. So if I'll go back to the directory where, where I downloaded Mimikatz, so it is in the user's directory, public. Mimikatz is downloaded over here. So I'll launch uh, Mimikatz. And now I can launch the command to look for uh, clear text passwords, log on passwords. And typically what Mimikatz does is that the LSAS process often contains the passwords in clear text and having the system privileges, it is able to do a dump of the, of the content of the memory and look for potential passwords or hashes in memory from the LSAS process. So this is here what the attacker has done. So next, uh, after he extracts uh, uh, password hashes or key text passwords, he might want to uh, uh, extract some files uh, or, or some documents. So he'll go to the uh, to the to the user. Uh, he might want to even create a, a, a local user if required. So he can create a user, local user, in case um, uh, some of the users change their password. So he will still have access. So net user, let's say test user one slash add, so he's creating uh, a user. Uh, he will go to the uh, desktop, let's say, of, uh, of the initial user desktop. And let's say he wants to compress the content of the desktop uh, and send it to, uh, to his FTP server. So he will use the rar command, he will create an archive, and the archive name will be loot.zip. And he wants to add a, a, a password to protect, password protect the zip file. So minus P is the argument for that. And he will choose a password uh, for the specific password protected zip file. So by doing that, this creates uh, uh, the zip file and he might now want to uh, 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 exfiltrate, it, exfiltrate this file to his FTP server. So he will connect to FTP, FTP 172 to his IP address. So his user is apt user, he'll put his password. So now he's on his, connected to his, to, to his FTP server and he's, he'll upload the loot.zip file to his, uh, uh, to his FTP server. So now he is done uh, uh, with that. So at this stage, we have completed all the different typical tasks that we see in APT uh, uh, in, in many APT uh, 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 breaches, where the attacker has done initial breach, escalated his privileges, created persistence, created other accounts, uh, 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 don't password using Mimikatz, which is a very common tool used by attackers, uh, uh, and exfiltrated data from, from the system. So now if you want to look at uh, uh, the way it looks like from uh, uh, the analyst perspective and what we're able to detect from these different uh, techniques and, and, uh, and breaches, so I'll just minimize this. 
So now by connecting to the NetWitness platform, we will be able to see uh, uh, the attack from the perspective of, a, of an analyst and see how we're able to detect these different uh, uh, techniques uh, uh, used by the, by the APT attacker uh, in an efficient way. So if I go to the respond module, which is uh, uh, the asset management module of the solution, uh, and again, RSA NetWitness contains, uh, provide visibility into logs, network, and endpoint data. So we're able to combine the correlations and the detection of all these uh, uh, data sets. And we can see that we have an incidence which is uh, prioritized as critical, uh, uh, which is tagged as being a possible APT uh, attack on a specific activity on a specific machine. So if I click on this specific incident, we can easily see that we have identified uh, uh, many of the different techniques that we want to identify because these are critical to our business, uh, 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 because it is techniques that we know are being used by APT groups that we expect to attack us based on, on, on different criteria. So we can see, uh, 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 for example, that there is a detection of a spear phishing attack. So they are all also uh, mapped to the micro attack framework. But what's even more important is not just that we are detecting these types of attacks, but the investigation is going to be very fast and very quick. So on the, in the center side, we have uh, graphical representations of different artifacts that are part of the attack. I could remove some that, that don't specifically uh, interest me. I could remove the MAC addresses and the file hashes, for example, and look just as at usernames, uh, file names, IP addresses, and so on. But then if I look at a specific uh, uh, technique, so if I look at the spear phishing, I can expand the event. And over here, I have the alert that the technique that has been identified. And under it, I have the actual uh, data that caused this specific technique to be detected. So in this case, it's a network session. And if I click on the network session, it will actually provide me with the reconstructed payload for that session. So this is the reconstructed mail payload uh, uh, as seen. So this is in, in text format. But if I change the format into email format, I will then see it as an email reconstructed as an actual email. And this is crucial for the, for the analyst because you can then quickly and very easily uh, confirm whether this is a false positive or not. In this case, we can clearly confirm that this is an actual phishing attack. And what's even more important is that this provides us with a lot of, of information and AOCs that we can use again to uh, enhance our detection capabilities or even to use in our preventive solutions to prevent the attack from happening in the future. So some of these indicators could be the email address, so it could be subject names, it could be if I, if I expand the attachments, I can see the actual attachment, uh, it can be the att attachment name. What's even more, and what's also important is that we can now also identify based on the on the IP on the on the email details, whether it's the email address or the subject or the attachment, who else in the environment has received this email, because maybe in some cases people receive the email but they haven't clicked on the attachment yet, but they might at some point. So we can reduce the impact uh, 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 the, or the damage that this the breach can 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 do by detecting the threat early and preventing any further uh, escalations from 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 there. So this is one of the of the actions. Uh, other, for example, is we can we have identified that the attacker has downloaded a credential dumping tool. In our case, it was Mimikat, so we downloaded Mimikatz. Again, again, I can expand the events that cause this specific uh, alert to trigger. I can uh, click on it, and I can see exactly which command have been executed on the on the on the system. So in this case, we can see on the on the right side, we can see different uh, parameters and information extracted. Uh, and we would be able to see the different commands executed by the attacker. Uh, uh, if required as well, we can look at, for example, the persistence with shuttle tasks. As we mentioned, same thing from the endpoint, we can look at the commands executed on the endpoint to cause uh, the specific uh, uh, behavior. So one thing we can do as well is that based on a process, I can also analyze the process and I can look at the process tree to look at how the, this file specifically got executed and what else did, 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 did it execute? So here I can clearly see that it started from the escalation of privileges from the, uh, for the helpers, which was the, 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 what was used to uh, uh, escalate privileges to system. PowerShell was executed, then a CMD. And we can see the different commands executed by the attacker. So again, this having all this information available in, uh, in front of the analyst saves a huge amount of time. Uh, I can see, for example, Mimikatz. If I put my, if I hover my mouse, I will, I will have the different arguments launched. If there were any arguments, uh, for example, for the RAR file, if I hover on it, I can see the exact command executed by the attacker. So RAR A for A for archive root.zip was the name of the zip file. 
So this is also critical for me to know because now I can search for this for the zip file in my network traffic, or I can see if any other user uh, uh, has a loaded zip file created. And most importantly, I have the password, so minus P for password and secret uh, with threes instead of E's as the password. So we can see we can have a full process suite to see how the attack started, how it ended. We can see the FTP session uh, and so on. So if you continue with the with the remaining uh, uh, indicators, we also have the password dumping activity where, where the actual the attacker actually executed Pemicats, uh, the creation of the local account, and we will be able to see as well uh, which account has been created, uh, uh, the creation of a password protected zip file. We already seen this one in the process tree that we just analyzed. And finally, the uh, data exfiltration, which was an FTP session. Again, in this case, it's a network session. I can click on the network session reconstruct the FTP session. So in this case, it's not an email, I go to the text view. And I can see the actual FTP session. We can see the username and password of the attacker in clear text. Uh, uh, we can see which file have been uh, 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 extracted. So in this case, 2.zip. But what's even more important is that I can uh, look at the files available within that session, in this case, 2.zip. I can extract the, the zip file and I can, I can save it in my, in my environment. And having the password, I can extract the, the content of, the, of, of that zip, zip file. So again, if I uh, expand uh, uh, the network session, I'll go to the files. This is the raw content, and I can download the file in my, on my system and extract it if, requ if required. So this is uh, uh, just uh, to give you an overall idea of how easy it becomes to identify, uh, uh, to prioritize threats and, and incidents based on the constituent alerts that are part of that incident. Uh, uh, how we can, by knowing and, ex and knowing who, what type of attacks to expect and what type of APTs to expect, having the right rules and the right content deployed in our SIM solution, because we don't want to be overwhelmed with incidents that don't matter to the environment. We want to really focus first and foremost to, to the things that matter to the organization, the things that will have a big and important impact and focus on those first and then go to the, to the uh, less uh, uh, critical inc incidents. Uh, um, and based on that, we can then quickly and, and, and very, very quickly investigate the incident, first by confirming whether, whether this is a false positive or not, uh, uh, and then investigate the rest of the, of the, of the, of the breach, extracting uh, artifacts, IOCs, to then enhance the detection mechanism in the future, as well as to implement those, those IOCs in our preventive solutions to be able to block uh, those attacks to happen in the future. So this is just a summary of, of, the, of, of the demo that has been done. So just a, a summary of the session. So first, uh, uh, to really have an efficient SOC, we really, need to re we really need to have proper visibility. And this is provided by having full visibility into log data, network data, endpoint data, whether it is on-prem or in the cloud. Of course, all this being enriched with uh, threat intelligence and business context. Then normalizing all these data sets to have a unified model in terms of, of data and data model. Uh, on which we can apply uh, 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 our correlation and our intelligence uh, uh, on top of it. So based on the normalized metadata, we will then do the advanced correlation. We'll do the machine learning to detect and identify threats. But as well, as we mentioned, we want to leverage proactive threat hunting to, to investigate and look for anomalies manually in this uh, uh, data set to look for potential breaches that have not been identified. Uh, uh, these alerts can be sent then to the uh, uh, action layer, which is basically the incident response where we want to investigate those incidents and, and we need a platform that allows us to easily uh, investigate uh, the incidents from A to Z to understand how the attack started, uh, who has been compromised, what are the indicators, uh, what is the impact, what has been exfiltrated and so on, as well as to the uh, SOAR platform, automation platform to automate as many tasks as possible. Uh, as many actions as possible to make the efficiency of the SOC even, even higher. And then leverage the outcomes of the incident response uh, procedures and the threat hunting procedures to enrich the threat intelligence even more and enhance the detection mechanisms of, of the solution to have a more efficient, uh, efficient SOC. So from our, from our assist perspective, 
there are different ways we can help. We can help from the technology side to have the correct, the proper technology required for such a SOC in terms of visibility into logs, network endpoint and UEBA, but as well in terms of analytics on the correlation part and the machine learning part with UEBA and the automation and the threat intelligence platform to manage the threat intelligence, prioritize it properly, uh, uh, have the confidence for each and every single IOC, which is uh, important into the threat intelligence platform. But having the technology alone, of course, is not enough. We need to also have the, right, the correct processes in place in terms of instant response uh, uh, in the SOC. Uh, so we can also help with the RSA Advanced Cyber Defense uh, team, which is our consultancy team that can do gap analysis for the SOC and help in building the processes, enhancing them, uh, evaluating where are the gaps, if there are any gaps and how to improve them and close those gaps. And finally, there's also, of course, we need the people, the right people to operate the technology and to follow the processes. Uh, so RSA University can provide all the different trainings required for this. So it is, it is in one part, it is the product training related to how to use the products, but it is not limited only to product. It's also a trainings around how to be an L1 analyst, how to be an L2 analyst, how to be a threat hunter, how to be a SOC manager and so on. So there are also trainings which are more vendor agnostic and more around security. And of course, whenever there are gaps in terms of resources, we know, understand that most organizations uh, in security, we don't have enough resources, resources in security. And that's where the RSA incident response team, which, which is a team of, of experts, threat hunters uh, uh, are available. So we can have return, retainers to have access to these resources to fill any gap that you might have in, in the organization. If you are investigating an incident or a breach and you need extra help to do these investigations, this team can jump in to support uh, 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 with the, the skills and resources and, and technologies to, to help with investigations. So this is it from my side. I hope this session was, was useful to you. Uh, uh, and thanks again and, and see you soon, hopefully.